This is episode 10 of Kursi Panas, the series that looks at hot seats across Malaysia in the state elections coming in just a few dates. I've gotten in a plane from Kuala Lumpur and returned back to the island of Penang. I wanted to examine whether or not this myth that the support patterns are only changing on the mainland is actually true. So I've decided to stay and return back to the island. And I'm looking at the seat of Balik Pulau, which actually is a parliamentary constituency that covers almost half of the island. There are three state seats within it, Telopahang, Bayan Lepas, and the seat that I'm concentrating on, Pulau Betong. It's a seat that has had many visitors. Anwar visited the day before I arrived. Rafizi visited the day I was there. You can see there is intensive competition in this entire area that has become quite politically hot. All of the seats in Balak Pulau have had considerable turnover in the last series of elections, in part traditionally because they were dominated by UMNO in Penang, but more recently we're seeing more pressures for whether or not Perkata National will make gains. Balak Pulau is a really stunning place. When you drive through the hills and into the narrow lanes that make up the villages, you see Kampong life right next to urban sprawl. You don't feel the traffic and the intensive population pressures that you feel in the rest of Penang, especially in the northern part of the island. You can see the sea and you can see the land. And it's a place where people toil the land. There's an intense involvement in agriculture. Historically, many centuries ago, this was a place where you had pepper, but now it's known particularly for its durians. You may have noticed this is a bit of a theme in the seats that I've looked at. The paddy fields capture this kind of semi-rural, but also rural areas that you see right next to urban communities. More than Penanti, which is much more contested, you don't get the sense that people are living in the same level of density, although the population size is still large. Among the issues besides agriculture, has been the issues and livelihoods for fishermen. This is an issue that has gained tremendous traction on the questions of reclamation around Bayan Lipas, or the PSI project, which of course has been highly controversial and opposed by those that are concerned about the environment and protecting the livelihoods of the fishermen. In looking at Balak Pulau, my questions that I asked about this particular area is whether or not the pressures and changes that are happening in terms of Perkata National will actually impact this particular area. Will Perkata National be able to challenge UMNO's prominence in this area? And will UMNO and Pakatan and Harapan be able to work together and their supporters support each other in order to be able to win these sets of seats? And will the ethnicized politics and the green wave dynamic that we see very evident in places like Penanti, will it extend into what's happening in the context of island Penang. A local friend in Balak Pulau described local politics as about that of the wind. It said, if the wind blows strong enough, the changes happen. And in explaining the consistent pattern of turnover in many of these seats, he pointed to the importance of the wind. And he notes, however, that the direction of the wind has really shifted this time that it is now, instead of coming from the island to the mainland, it's coming from the mainland to the island. But he also pointed out that the pressures and change and dynamics are within the island itself. The conditions and livelihoods of local people in Balak Pulau have faced real challenges from development. There has always been a tension between providing infrastructure and facilities, but also at the same time maintaining the traditional way of life that people wanted to maintain in these communities. The question of sustainability, the questions of environment, the questions of protecting cultural traditions and communities are always salient when you deal with the challenges of development and growing numbers of population. Balak Pulau, as a constituency from a perspective of the parliament, has three state seats, Bayan Lepas, which has been in the news because of Dominic Lau, who is the Karakan president who's been slated here in Bayan Lepas. And he has actually been seen to be opposed by PAS. And of course, it's been very revealing about how 
the inter-ethnic cooperation in Berkta National doesn't necessarily extend very well to accepting non-Malay candidates, which I think has been pretty evident despite the recent apology. This particular dynamic, which now as a result favors the Amana candidate for Pakatan Harapan, in the sense that Dominic Lau doesn't necessarily gain the same level of traction and may not receive the same level of Malay support. So it's in the other two seats of Teluk Pahang and Pulau Beton that you see more likeliness of having political change and turnover. Teluk Pahang is being contested by the son of a very important political warlord, someone very powerful in Amno, uh, a man called Shahidan, and his son is the one contesting there. You can see the question becomes whether or not Amno will maintain its political base or any political base. There are only two seats that seem at least somewhat favorable for Amno. One of this is Tlopahang, the other one is Burtam and the mainland, where Rizal Marikan is contesting. This seat, I think, will face significant challenges as well. But in Pulau Beton, you have a PKR candidate running against a PAS candidate. You have a situation where you have the battle of the Hajis, as I call it. It's a straight fight. You have a career politician, now a man called Mohammed Tua Ismail, who's 58. He's been a member of the Penang State Religious Council. He's been active in PKR. He's running against a man called Mohammed Shukur bin Zakaria, who was a former principal at a local school. He's in his 60s, 61. And these two men are trying to face off. Voters I spoke to know both individuals, especially the Malay community knows both. I think the cross-ethnic communities, you saw more of familiarity with Mohammed Tua. They're seen as likable, amiable. Mohammed Tua is seen as connecting to the political base. But what we also found is that they were seen as ordinary just assemblymen doing their job and a contender against them. So there wasn't that much of a wow factor from the candidates. What was more talked about were the visits from political on high. So there's a recognition at the national level that this indeed is a hot seat. This Haji battle will come down to a whole series of things. Analytically, there are a few very important points. The first one is the issue of the Green Wave. In Penanti, we saw the strategy to handle the green wave by fielding an Ustas. In this case of Pulo Betong, you have a situation where you continue to have somebody who has religious credentials on the part of PKR. It's a way to nullify that particular pressures. You also see a situation where, if you look at voting patterns, you have a dynamic of ethnic polarization. If there's one state in the country where you really see the ethnic polarization as being very sharp, that is Penang. Pakatan Harapan won only a very small share of the vote, around 12%. And you have to keep in mind that in Penang, the Pakatan Harapan has been in government since 2008. It's been a DAP government, and the DAP has been unable to garner significant Malay support in Penang, even in the island. And we can see this in some of the voting patterns. In Pulau Betong, Pakatan Harapan only won 18% of the Malay vote. So it won relying itself on Chinese vote and Indian vote in this constituency. This constituency is a mixed constituency. It's a Malay majority constituency, but not overwhelmingly so. So it's around 66% Malay, 28% Chinese, another 4% of Indians, so you see a situation where there is around a third of non-Malay composition. So Muhammad Tua will rely heavily on winning this seat by trying to win the Malay support that Amno won, which is 33% in G15. If he wins that, he should win the seat handily. But the question now has become, where will Amno's vote go? Will it go to a relatively locally known but not as dynamic, past candidate with the party influences along ethnic lines? Or will it move to Pakatan Harapan? 
So in this place where voting has been ethnically polarized, where non-Malays have voted for Pakatan Harapan, where Malays have not, the UMNO factor becomes very pivotal. When I met with UMNO machinery in the local area, there is not that same level of cooperation. Yes, it's there. They know their partners together. But there's a discomfort in that relationship, in part because ethnicized politics and the enemies of each other have long been embedded within the context of Penang politics. AMNO and DAP are fierce competitors here. Those who support Pakatan Harapan, especially among the Malays, are very loyal. And those that oppose DAP are very strong in their views. So now voters are being asked to change. UMNO party workers talk about a kind of silence or a kind of unease when they engage the electorate. In order for PAS to win this seat, they have to win at least 20% of the Malay vote, which means they have to win about half of Barisat National's voters. Surveys suggest that this is not impossible. And so this is why we see the visits on high. It's very, very competitive. We also see that this place in Balik Pulau and in Pulau Beton is actually a place where we have the same generation shift that we find nationally. What happened in this particular constituency is that Parkton National, in particular in GE15, did very well among voters under 25. 50% of the voters under 25 went to Parkton National, with only 28% going to Pakatan Harapan and 21% going to Amno. So while there was more division of those voters over 26, and in fact, actually, Pakatan Harapan did very well among those voters, it was these younger voters that are 5 to 6% of the electorate that are going to be very decisive in shaping if this contest comes down. I sat down with a group of them having a chat. There was a lot of indecision and undecidedness about them. Many of the women in particular, the younger women, were less decided. They were watching. They said, Do we want to vote for the national or do we want to vote for the state that's actually done a few things that they like in terms of improving governance? You could see there was a tension. They were not yet decided. They felt both of the candidates were very old. They didn't think that it would matter either one would vote, but they knew it wouldn't be important about the relative messages in terms of voting for Pakistan national versus PKR. Some of them were a bit more uneasy with past because PAS, they felt, was a bit more conservative than that they wanted. So you can see that it's not that young people aren't informed or aren't educated. Yes, there are some shortcomings in terms of political literacy, but more rather that they don't know which of these things to decide on. They haven't yet made their mind up. What I was struck in my conversations with younger voters was how much they were thinking about them and talking it among themselves. There's this perception that younger voters are just disengaged. And yes, there are many that are, because they don't think that any of the political parties offer much for them. But there were also those that were just thinking and engaging. They were now tuning in. And this is what happens in the last few days of the campaign. As they tune in, and as we see whether or not the wind blows and which direction that it blows on the island, There are real questions about what will happen in Penang politics. The issue is whether or not the Pakatan Harapan government, led by DAP, will maintain two-thirds of the seats in the state assembly. A seat like Pula Betong will help to shape that outcome. Increasingly, the two-thirds is becoming more challenging in Penang, as Pakatan National appears to be making more gains. The second question is about the composition of the government. How many Malay majority seats will the DAP and Pakatan Harapan have in its government? What level of Malay representation will there be in this government? These questions of inclusion are not just about non-Malays, they're also about Malays and the quality and caliber of that representation. It looks like some of the PKR seats favor PKR being important in this. 
but it will be interesting to see whether or not Amno wins any and where those seats actually are. The third question is about the scope and the nature of the voting. Many of you who follow my writings will know that after GE15, I wrote an article about ethnic polarization, the polarized electorate, and I subsequently wrote articles that continued to point to the ethnic patterns of voting. And while I recognize and in my work acknowledge multiple factors in shaping voting, issues of class, issues of gender, and so forth, we still see that in a place like Penang, the ethnic factor is quite stark in terms of shaping voting patterns. And the ethnic polarization will shape what type of government comes next and the type of discourse. Penang is a place where the racialized discourse is very emotive. It's not far below the surface. And this makes it challenging to deal with these serious problems of the environment, representation of the fishermen, representation of different communities. The question of what's happening in a place like Balut Pulau is not just about ethnicity, it's about the choices one makes about how one develops a place and how it promotes the questions of sustainability and it goes about it. Not easy issues to answer and made more difficult when you have an ethnicized dynamic in politics. The word betong means bamboo, and it's usually referred to in the context of bamboo tied together in a raft. And in a place like Pulau Betong, the question of whether or not things will be tied together, whether or not the communities will be able to be integrated together in a strong way to be able to manage the winds, is very pertinent. Right now, the actual bamboo seems quite divided. Penang is a beautiful pearl. It's a beautiful place. But it's a place where its politics, under the surface, are not as pretty. Thanks for joining me in this episode. We'll continue to stay in the North on our next episode.